Good afternoon. My name is Kelly Gibson and I lead the development and alumni relations team at UGA's College of Veterinary Medicine. As an alumni myself, I consider it a great honor and responsibility to help advance UGA's mission. Thank you all for joining us today to learn more about COVID-19 research and the College of Vet Med. As you have questions throughout this presentation, please submit using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. At UGA's College of Veterinary Medicine, we're driven by a deep and powerful passion to define and deliver all that veterinary medicine can and should be. We educate and elevate our students, transforming them into legions of highly trained doctors and tenacious researchers who are driven to serve communities of pet lovers, experienced veterinarians, farmers and ranchers, and the wildlife in our own backyards. We provide services for animals and their owners in our state-of-the-art teaching hospital where we see over 30,000 cases each year. Research efforts within the college are aimed at enhancing the quality of life for animals and people, improving the productivity of poultry and livestock, and preserving a healthy interface between wildlife and people and the environment they share. In addition to the DVM program, the college offers master's PhD and dual degree programs for students who want to pursue a career in veterinary medicine or a related field, including public health and biomedical research. The College of Veterinary Medicine is leading the way in immunology and vaccine development, which is why you are all here today. Dr. Ted Ross is the director of the Center for Vaccines and Immunology within the College of Vet Med. He is a Georgia Research Alliance eminent scholar and professor of infectious diseases. Dr. Ross completed his undergraduate and graduate studies at the University of Arkansas, and he received a doctorate in microbiology and immunology from Vanderbilt University. We're thankful he joined the UGA faculty in 2015. Dr. Ross has published more than 130 papers and book chapters on infectious disease and vaccine development, and has been an invited speaker at more than 130 national and international conferences. He participates in several vaccine working groups at the NIH, CDC, and World Health Organization. Ross has spent most of his career studying viruses and developing new vaccines and treatments to combat them, but he is perhaps best known for his efforts to develop a universal influenza vaccine that could protect against all forms of the virus and eliminate the need for seasonal flu shots. Like many researchers at UGA, he is now focusing on developing and testing new vaccines and immunotherapies to combat COVID-19. Dr. Ross, we are anxious to hear about your work. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that introduction. That was very nice. Hopefully everybody can hear me and they can see the slides. If so, what I'm going to do is tell you a brief story today. It's actually two stories, one about coronavirus and one about our universal flu and how the two are intersecting. Assuming I can move forward there. Uh, I think many of you probably are hearing this in the news, but I'm gonna go over it as if you've never heard this before. You know, COVID-19 is actually the disease that is caused by this recently found uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's a coronavirus. Um, this outbreak is thought to have originated in China in the late 2019. And so far, there's been very little information about this virus, and we're learning about this virus almost every day. So one of the things I wanted to bring out to everyone is that the World Health Organization director had a quote, which I liked, which said, we cannot say this loudly enough or clearly enough or often enough but every country in the world could still change the course of this pandemic. This pandemic is not over. In fact, we're probably looking at multiple waves of this pandemic over the next two years. So all of us have a role to play in trying to stem the tide of this virus spreading, infecting our friends and family and neighbors across the world. So I wanna say the coronavirus has been around for quite some time. There have been a lot of different types of coronaviruses that infected people over the last uh, uh, thousands of years. Um, and most of them cause a very mild cold-like disease. But recently, um, we've been identifying new strains of coronavirus that seem to come from the natural world, primarily from bats and cats that are in the wild. And they are in causing a very severe disease in humans when they infect us. 
In 2003, there was an outbreak of what was known as the original SARS. There was also a Middle Eastern version of this that occurred in 2015, and now we're dealing with the SARS-2 coronavirus. So here's what we know. If you get infected with this virus, you can have these symptoms known as COVID-19 disease. It's a, associated with a very high body temperature. You feel very tired and weak, really more weak in, than any other kind of disease that you've had. And it's also associated with what's called a dry cough, where you're having trouble, you know, getting a lot of mucus in your lungs, but you're just coughing all the time. And so this can be spread from person to person, or it can be spread by droplets landing on the surface of a, an object, a door handle, or money, or some other mechanism which gets transferred to you, and then you touch it and you get it in your eyes and nose and mouth. So people say, well, how can that happen? Well, here's an example. When somebody coughs or somebody sneezes, there are billions of these little droplets that spew out of your mouth and nose, and they can hang out in the air for a while and eventually they'll settle down on a surface. And so it can be a direct infection, either your child coughs on you, an elderly person coughs on you, or some neighbor or friend out in the society, or you touch something that somebody has coughed or sneezed on. And these particles last for quite some time and you pick them up and you actually transport them to your own body. We know that this virus is a little different in the disease that it causes. People can be infected with this virus for several days before they ever start showing any signs of disease. But they are shedding the virus from their nose even when they don't have any symptoms. That is really unusual for most of these types of viruses, whether it's an influenza virus or a coronavirus. Usually you get symptoms within a few days. This can take up to a week before you start to feel symptoms. And there are people who actually may be asymptomatic and never show symptoms. This is really what is causing the spread of this virus so easily between people and around the world. So it said if you have symptoms, the CDC and the state of Georgia public health labs say if you have symptoms, you should immediately call your doctor and determine whether or not you have COVID-19 like symptoms. They'll give you instructions on the phone. And then if they can, they will give you a viral test to determine if you are actually shedding virus in your nose. From there, you follow your doctor's instructions, which is usually to self-isolate and to not be around other people for up to 14 days. I should point out though, that it's estimated about 80% of the people will recover from this disease without needing any special treatment. So it's really unclear why some people get a disease that's very mild and others that get a very severe disease that lead to hospitalization and end up in the ICU and they will die from this infection. We just don't know enough about this virus yet to understand why these things are happening. There does seem to be a um, correlation between your age and your health status and dying from this particular disease. So people that are older are more likely to be hospital and die than kids, but it's not that nobody in any age will not be infected. We now know kids can get a disease, they can spread it, even if they don't have severe disease and symptoms. Now I took this off of yesterday's numbers, so I'm sure this is different today. I think here in the United States, we now have over 1.4 million cases. This number on the right, the deaths due to this virus is now estimated to be at 85,000. So there's a lot of people that are being infected and dying every day and that number still continues to rise here in this country. Worldwide, you can see that there's millions of people that are being infected and dying from this disease. And if you do your math, you'll notice that about a third of the cases in, this, in the world are coming from the United States. And that's probably due to two reasons. One, because we're testing and identifying those cases and also because of the way we're operating societally compared to other countries. So what you can do to prevent is to wash your hands, to keep a distance, to wear masks, cover your mouth and nose, seek mental attention if you actually feel bad, and try your best not to touch your eyes, nose, and mouth. I know that's really hard, but that's really the, the, the right now, our way of protecting ourselves from getting this virus in, uh, into our bodies. So, um, I'm going the wrong way, I apologize. If you feel, sick, you should stay at home, you should self-isolate, you should not go out. 
I encourage everyone to wear masks. Here in the College of Veterinary Medicine, wearing masks have now become very common. We wear masks in the hallways, in our laboratories. Anytime we're around other people, we've limited the number of people we interact with on a daily basis. And it's really the best way for us to prevent spreading disease and bringing it into our um, college here on the campus. And what I wanna tell you also is that this is not the first time that we've seen this type of disease and mortality associated with a respiratory infection. Almost a hundred years ago, we saw this flu-like illness affect people here in the United States and around the world. This is an example of an army barracks in Kansas and all of these military recruits are in bed in a big army warehouse because they are sick with this flu-like illness. And this was associated with military people preparing to go to World War I. So people were moving across the country. They were coming in contact with people they never came in contact with before. They, the military was really an easy place for this virus to begin to spread. And as soldiers moved across the Atlantic, it really started to spread in this country and around the world. And so here's examples of policemen in Boston in 1918. And notice that they're wearing masks looks very similar to what we're doing today. Here's hospital nurses in Philadelphia. They're wearing masks. But notice down at the bottom on, that, on, that, uh, on the words down there, this flu pandemic killed 200,000 Americans in October, one month alone. That is more than what has currently been and have died from the current SARS-V2. Back then in 1918, they were not practicing social distancing and they were not keeping themselves away. And you can see what happens with a respiratory virus like this when it begins to spread throughout the population. In November of 1918, all the soldiers began to come home from Europe and they transported this virus back into the United States in the winter of 1918. And we went through another wave of flu-like illness as these soldiers returned home. People became so scared of being around, being inside that they started holding all of their activities outside. Here's an example of people in court, getting their hair cut, taking classes. But eventually we ran out of hospital beds and then they set up tents and then they ran out of tents. So people were just being put out on the lawn. This is what we could have faced here in 2020 had we not started having social distancing. Hospitals in major metropolitan areas were really being stressed because they didn't have enough beds and enough nurses and enough respiratory equipment to protect themselves or their patients. And this actually was then a third wave that led into the spring of 1919, which people were still dying. And here's an example in France. These are soldiers that are recovering. And notice they're at a movie theater and every one of them is wearing masks pretty much what we need to do today. And the last picture I'll show you from this time period is these are, these are graveyard in a hospital in England. These are American soldiers that had been wounded in the war and were, were still recovering from their wounds, pretty serious wounds that they had received in March of 1919. And someone brought this influenza virus into the hospital and it swept through this hospital and all these American soldiers died from influenza-like infection. So they could survive the war, they could survive their injuries, but they could not survive this virus. And they're buried in this graveyard in this hot military hospital in England to this day. So no one is immune from this virus. No one's immune from SARS-CoV-2 virus and we need to take it seriously. In the end, 50 million people died worldwide 10 to 20% of the entire world population died from this disease. Uh, sorry, had, were infected and three to 6% died. In the United States, we had 675,000 Americans that died. If we continue on the path that we're on and we don't try and get a, a handle on this and we don't come up with a vaccine, we could see numbers like this over the next few years. So I wanted to say that flu is still with us today. We have a seasonal influenza season that occurs between October and April, usually peaks in January and February. And one of my biggest concerns is that as we still have coronavirus circulating in our population, 
when we hit flu season, we will have both flu and coronavirus in the winter. And this could be a very devastating, highly lethal period of time in this country's history coming up in the winter months. Flu will cause a lot of disease, a lot of hospitalizations, a lot of death. It also takes a huge economic burden. And that's on top of the economic burden that we're having right now due to SARS coronavirus. Just gonna say most of the people that die from influenza are elderly. That's very similar to what we're seeing with coronavirus. So I wanna just tell you just two more slides before I turn it over to Q&A about what we're doing here in the Centers for Vaccine and Immunology. <clears throat> we have a algorithm, a computer algorithm that will identify what are the most important parts of a virus to make a vaccine for. We have done this for influenza and we're now currently doing this for SARS coronavirus. Our work with influenza led to this very large contract that came from the government in September of 2019 and we started working and moving towards getting our vaccines into the clinic. With coronavirus taking over our lives, NIH is now redirecting us to bring coronavirus into our center this collaborative influenza vaccine innovation center that we have here at UGA to both make a coronavirus vaccine and a universal flu vaccine and combine those two together into a single vaccine for the population. We are not working alone. UGA is leading an effort of 34 investigators around the United States and around the world. Many of them are here at UGA, but they're also at various hospitals and universities and we are working as one large team now to make this universal flu vaccine and this universal coronavirus vaccine together. And this is really a unique opportunity to bring us scientists together and our physicians together to help us develop um, this broad respiratory based vaccine. We are not alone. We work with Mount Sinai in New York, Duke University, the University of Maryland, as well as the National Institutes of Health led by Tony Fauci. And this is all being put to the test. We are quickly developing these vaccines, moving them through our animal models and getting them to the clinic so that we can have in 2021, a broad flu vaccine and a broad coronavirus vaccine combined together. So I don't do this alone. There's a lot of people that help me and we get a lot of funding sources, but this is a large endeavor, the largest endeavor I've ever been associated with. And we're trying to get up to the task. So now I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you. I don't know how to unshare. Thank you, Dr. Ross. The questions are flying in, so we're just gonna go ahead and jump right to it. Um, okay. If someone has antibodies to COVID-19, are they immune from further infection? Well, that's a question that has been posed to me several times. And the answer I give to politicians and to the media is we don't know. What we know is that this virus does cause a very strong immune response. People that get infected will seroconvert. That means they'll make antibodies. But we don't know yet whether those antibodies will prevent a second infection, whether they're neutralizing the virus, whether we're able to prevent you from getting infected again and again. We also don't know how long these antibodies will last. And there are examples of other infectious disease pathogens that make strong antibody responses, but don't actually protect you. An example would be, for example, HIV makes a very strong antibody response, but it does not prevent people from getting infected. So that's a very important question for us to understand from infection, because that will lead to how we design a vaccine effectively. We need to make antibodies that target the right part of the virus, and will actually neutralize the virus and will not allow infection. And those studies are now ongoing here at UGA as well as other institutions. But to be honest with you, I can't answer that question today. So it's, I think it's good that you might have antibodies, but I can't say that they're actually going to protect you yet. Thank you. So we're seeing several questions about um, the virus and mutation and just like the flu developing a new vaccine every year. Once we develop a, a, a vaccine for COVID-19, um, how effective will it be a year from now? So influenza and coronaviruses are really two different types of viruses. 
The reason flu viruses change so rapidly is that they are, they're called segmented viruses. Think of it like a deck of cards. And that virus is able to shuffle its deck with other strains of influenza. And every year they can come up with a new version of flu. Coronavirus really only has one version of itself that will slowly mutate. As long as it doesn't mutate in the very region that we make our best immune responses to, our vaccine should last for a long, long time. Think of it like mumps, measles, rubella. Those viruses only have one version. So when we make a vaccine and it's effective, it will be effective from now for the rest of your life. So we're hoping that coronavirus isn't going to change so dramatically that we would have to switch out the vaccine on an annual basis. I can't say that we wouldn't be able to, that we'll make a vaccine that will last a lifetime, but that is one of our targets here at UGA is to try and make a vaccine that will be universal so it doesn't matter if the virus starts to change, we will still have immunity to all the different variants that this virus may throw at us. Fantastic. So it seems like um, as scientists, we continue to um, have much unknown and we're still trying to get lots of answers to our questions. So let's talk about um, you know, what you need to get these answers. If you were to receive a $100,000 gift, a $500,000 gift, a million dollar gift, what could that help you with your research in getting these answers? Well, there's two levels to that question. Um, we need to know more basic information about the virus itself. And how we do it here at UGA, because we're very strong in, in veterinary medicine, is we use animal models to you test our vaccines, to determine what's the best immune mechanisms that it takes to protect the animal against infection. And we use those as surrogates to help us um, decide what vaccine should move to the clinic. So we know so little about this virus, we do not even yet know why people get mild disease, why people get severe disease. Those are questions that we can answer. We also don't even know which part of the virus we should be targeting. And so we need to make a lot of different vaccines and test them to determine how well they function. At the other level is once we identify a vaccine that we want to move forward, we need funding to make what is called clinical grade material. Those are very expensive. We wanna put the best material into people when we test this vaccine. Um, it has to be pure, it has to be clean, and that's a very expensive process. And then lastly, we wanna do clinical trials. And clinical trials are very expensive. So a lot of research dies in this thing called the valley of death between designing the vaccine, testing it, and getting it to the clinic. And most of it has to do with, with manufacturing. And so if we had uh, funding that would help us manufacture these vaccines effectively, we could do many more clinical trials, which is really where you find out whether this vaccine works or not, it's whether it works in people. Thank you. Getting several questions about testing. Um, so can you please explain the different types of testing that we're hearing about in the news and what those different tests tell us? Yeah, there are three types of testing that is being done. Um, the one that most people are familiar with are the swabs in your nasal cavity. And that is looking for the genetic information of the virus. We put that on the swab. We then amplify that in a, in a machine that will tell us whether or not you actually have the, the viral genetic material in your system. You can also do what's called an antigen test, which actually can be taken from the nasal swab or it can be taken from a surface. And that tells you whether or not the proteins of the virus are present. It doesn't tell you whether the virus is alive or dead, but it tells you the virus shell is there. And then the third type of test is an antibody test. And what that tells us right now is whether or not you have been exposed at some point in the past and that you have generated an immune response. It doesn't tell us when you were exposed, it just tells us you had been exposed at some point. And so since there's many asymptomatic people it's nice to look at whether or not people have been exposed. And right now at UGA, my group and the Clinical Translational Research Unit on the medical campus are doing a seroservance study here in Athens to see how many people have been exposed and never knew that they were exposed. It will tell us what populations are most likely to be infected. It will help tell us whether or not 
this virus has been around longer in our community than we realize because many people don't ever come down with severe disease. Thank you. We have some questions here about concern for you and your team who are continuing to operate right now. So you're trying to find these very important answers for us. So could you kind of talk about that process about, you know, what, um, what your fellow staffers and, and maybe graduate students that we might have that are working closely with you each day? Yeah, so we have uh, different types of laboratories here on the campus. Uh, we have uh, regular laboratories and offices in our location here in the college where we are now wearing masks routinely. Um, we social distance. We, everyone in the laboratory is separated by a pretty big distance. We have gone into shift schedules where some people work the morning and some work the afternoon, so we don't have as many people in here. Um, we've also shifted to some people that are working where they might be here on the weekend even so that they can avoid being having a big bolus in the middle of the week. Having everybody work on Tuesday, Wednesday, we have spread it out. But when we work with the virus itself, we go into our Animal Health Research Center, which is on the College of Vet Med campus. This is a two-story building that is all for containment um, of deadly pathogens, um, and such as this one. And when we go into that facility, we put on full gowns, we put on respirators. Um, we're basically head to toe covered in a moon suit where we have our own filtered air. And then we work with the virus itself in those conditions so that we can actually look at it um, for uh, testing our vaccines, looking at the pathology and understanding the infectious disease um, strategies that we need to use. And so that's a, people get trained for that. It takes months to get trained it's not something you can just do on a dime. And our teams have been doing this because we've been working with high path influenza and some other biodefense pathogens for years. So my lab and some other labs on campus, Dr. Jeff Hogan, Dr. Mark Tompkins, we are all working as a team on COVID research now because we were all had our teams trained to do this. And I know firsthand how hard this group is working right now. I love that our Bulldogs out there are asking questions about collaboration right now. So they're asking specific questions about how you are coordinating your research with those across the country, across the world. How are our scientists working together to find these answers? Well, it's really unprecedented what, what's happening right now. I mean, nobody seems to be worried about competition and credit, even though that's always part of the the fun part about being a scientist is wanting to do things first and, and be um, know the answer before anybody else does. But currently we're putting our data online without necessarily being peer reviewed. We're just saying, here's what we found. Everybody can see it at once. Uh, COVID has generated numerous collaborations in the last 60 days. Uh, we currently have seven corporate collaborations that started in the last two months. When it comes to campus collaboration, I think between the three researchers I mentioned, we probably have 20 to 25 new collaborations here at UGA alone. And that doesn't include all the ones we have nationally and internationally. And so we are working pretty much harder than we've ever worked. Um, I, but the thing is, is this is what we were trained for. So really this pandemic is really a once in a lifetime opportunity to put our our skills and our network together about what we've been trained for all this time. Very exciting. Um, getting some questions about the um, predictors um, of the virus, of those that are affected more severely um, by the virus. What can you tell us about um, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, um, and what kind of information is going into identifying those high risk populations? So one of the reasons why NIH tapped us to start working with the coronavirus and wanted to provide new funding for that was our Center for Vaccines that we're developing is all focused on high-risk populations. So it was very natural for us to then take on COVID research to look at high-risk populations. So we're doing this in people and we have animal models that, that focus on this. So we have models for elderly, we have it for obesity, which are targets, um, we have it for immunocompromised people. Obesity is really an interesting factor. The receptor 
for this virus is not only found in the respiratory tract, but it's also found in adipose tissue. And our fat cells in our body are actually targeted by this virus. And so if you have, if you're obese and you have a fatty liver or a fatty heart, this virus is getting to those, lo those organs very easily and causing a lot of the severe disease and mortality in this population. Another interesting factor, which you've heard about through the press, and we're seeing that also here at UGA, is that there does seem to be a component associated with African Americans being infected and dying more likely from this virus than other races. We've seen this both in infections and we've also seen this with serology. Those African American population is more likely to have antibodies, meaning they're more likely to have been exposed than uh, whites and Asians here in this community. Why that is could be a lot of socioeconomic factors. It also could be genetics. And we just don't know how to tease that apart yet. And so it's going to take a lot of research to understand why this is happening. Thank you, Dr. Ross. We're going to keep rapid fire here. Um, I don't think we've asked this question yet. Talk about um, what we're hearing about sunlight and heat having an impact on the virus. Well, these are envelope viruses. Um, envelope, there's two different types of viruses, enveloped and non-enveloped. Envelope viruses are very susceptible to drying. As soon as they're dry, they're dead. They have this nice shell. Think about like a blanket that they coat themselves in. As soon as that liquid blanket um, evaporates, then they die. So usually viruses like influenza and others that are respiratory go it's not that they don't circulate in the population, but they don't spread very well. And so it takes um, more effort for them to transmit. So you usually see very few cases in the summertime. The other thing about light is UV light particularly can kill these viruses. So it's thought that if you have more sunlight, you might, and it's on your skin or it's on your face or nose, those are more likely to die. Those viruses are more likely to die than if it, you didn't have sunlight. All right, is there a particular site that you would recommend our audience visit for information on up-to-date statistics in Georgia? So there's two sites. One is you can go to the CDC or you can go to the Georgia Public Health Laboratory or Public Health site, um, the State Health Lab. It keeps an updated daily tally of cases that come in and mortality associated with this. The Georgia Public Health Labs are leading an initiative to test people in this state. So they usually have the most updated, up-to-date information. You know, they have engaged our university systems. Uh, George, UGA is one of them, along with Georgia State, Georgia Tech, Augusta Health Systems, and Emory. We're all working together to help testing for the Georgia Health Public Health Labs. It's been an unprecedented initiative that the universities in Georgia have all come together. It helps that for years, the Georgia Research Alliance has been funding high level scientists to recruit them to Georgia. And we're now all in these universities and our expertise is being utilized now by the state. The governor put up a task force to help increase testing and the university systems are part of that network that are actually testing um, our residents here in Georgia. All right. Um, question about the vaccine. Um, once it's created, will we need a vaccine every year? And will there be different um, versions of the vaccine? Will there be a stronger one for um, elderly? Well, you know, there's been a lot of talk about how fast a vaccine can be made and when, when, whether one will be ready in 12 months or 18 months. One of the things we learn from vaccines is that most vaccines do, they fail it takes a while to develop an effective vaccine. So just because there's a, the first vaccine gets made doesn't mean it will always be the most effective and doesn't mean other vaccines that come along may be more effective um, for the population. In addition, even once a vaccine is developed, there are some factors that go into manufacturing the vaccine, getting enough doses, not only for the United States population, but for the entire world's population. And that takes a lot of money and a lot of commitment to develop. In, the, in this country, we have about 350 million people. 
And that would take years to make that many doses of the vaccine, particularly since when a new novel vaccine is made, it oftentimes takes more than one dose to get high titer protective immunity. So instead of 350 million doses, you would need 700 million doses just to give everybody a single round of vaccination. That's a daunting task and we're just one country. <laughs> so even once a vaccine is made, it will most likely be targeted to people in high risk groups like healthcare workers, first responders, people in nursing homes before it's given just widely to the public. And so it's gonna take you need to be prepared that it's gonna take years for us to develop a vaccine to be as routine as we have for influenza. I don't think that's the answer the audience wanted to hear, Ted. So we will move right into um, what does a typical day look like for you and your team in the lab? Is it repetitive for each scientist? Kind of describe what a typical day looks like for you other than Zoom calls and national media. <laughs> Yeah, Zoom calls every day, all day long. Uh, <laughs> so routinely now, me and my colleagues and I are arriving at the office around 7 a.m. and we're staying to 6 or 7 p.m. every night. Um, our teams, as I said, come in early. So we have a shift that comes in at 7 and stays to about 2. And then another shift that shows up at 2 is working to 9 o'clock at night. Um, it's, it's been daunting to try and keep up. There's so much to do. Um, it's not repetitive, that's for sure. Um, we are working on human studies. We're working on animal studies. We're developing assays in the laboratory because when you have a new virus like this, oftentimes you don't have, you have almost no assays available. You have to invent them. And so we learn from our other colleagues around the world. We bring those assays in the lab and then we get them expertise on them so we can use them. And then we're developing homemade assays right here so that we can be more effective at analyzing our data and also helping to identify people that might be infected. I think we have time for just a couple more questions. Uh, why don't we talk a little bit about um, the effects of COVID-19 on children um, and especially what we're hearing more and more about the pediatric multisymptom inflammatory syndrome. So um, tell us what you know about that and should we be concerned? Well, it, it seemed unusual that children at the beginning didn't seem to be getting infected or seem to be immune. Oftentimes, little kids, particularly infants, are considered a high-risk population. And so, the, and most of the time, a virus that affects the elderly severely will affect infants severely. Um, but now we know that children are getting infected. Oftentimes, the disease is mild, but just like in adults, there's a subpopulation of, of children that are coming down with this highly inflammatory disease. What that means is their immune system is recognizing the virus, but they're overreacting to it. They're overreacting to the point that they're damaging their own body, their own cells. And they're ending up with this disease known, very similar, um, a disease known, known as Kawasaki disease, in which it bursts the blood vessels, it attacks the blood vessels, and, they, and the children get rash and spots all over their bodies and they essentially will shut down. They can't get enough oxygen, they can't breathe, their entire circulatory system is being destroyed. So that's really an unusual situation. It doesn't happen very often, but it also tells us how little we know and understand about how this virus works in all different populations of people. And the more we see cases, the more likely we're gonna see new um, clinical syndromes that we're not expecting. Thank you. Let's end on somewhat of a positive note about what we can control in our daily lives. So what can you suggest to all of us about ways we can boost our immune system or fight the virus um, right now? And so let's, let's leave with something we have control over. Well, what you have control over is your interactions with other people. That's really your number one thing you can do. We don't really know of many effective treatments outside of just palliative care, taking aspirin you have a headache or fluids when you're feeling sick. But the best thing to do is to not interact with people in a way where you can expose them or they can expose you. So wearing a mask is important, limiting how you interact with people, you know, going out to restaurants. I stopped by last night to pick up some dinner on the way home. 
and I was a little stunned how crowded the restaurant was and actually felt a little itchy and uncomfortable just standing there waiting for my food, even though I was wearing a mask. Not everybody in that restaurant was. And I think people need to realize and take this seriously. Otherwise, this virus is not going to go away and it's going to be with us for many years to come. So you can control your destiny. That's what I would say. Fantastic. Well, unfortunately, it looks like we are out of time. Thank you, Dr. Ross, for sharing your expertise with us today. Um, I know that we are all very much enlightened and hopefully we are all very curious and we have more questions um, right now, but we appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today. And thank you to the audience for spending the afternoon with us. If you would like to find out more information about upcoming sessions in the Ask Me Anything series, and if you would like to learn more about how you can support COVID-19 research that's happening right here at the University of Georgia, visit alumni.uga.edu. And remember Bulldogs, we're in this together. Wash your hands, stay safe, and as always, go dogs. <laughs>